Next up, I'm excited to introduce Mike Schrapfer. Mike is Meta's first senior fellow where he focuses on supporting the company's strategic technology priorities, including its investments in AI and development of technical talent. From 2013 to 2022, he served as Meta's chief technology officer, where he led the development of the technology and teams that enable the companies to scale to billions of people around the world and make breakthroughs in fields like AI and virtual reality. In addition to his work at Meta, Mike is a climate tech investor and a philanthropist. He is the co-founder of Additional Ventures, a purpose-driven organization powering bold, high-risk innovations to solve complex challenges across climate action, biomedical research, community resiliency, and American democracy. Mike is joined by Alexander Wen, CEO and founder at Scale. Alex, over to you. Shrep, super, uh, super excited to be, uh, be chatting here today. Glad, glad to be here. Um, so I think uh, we're gonna hopefully cover a lot of different technologies and AI in particular, and sort of uh, a lot of the, the sort of tech that you've worked on. But um, maybe it's always fun to just start with the story of people's careers and sort of how they they got to uh, the working on the problems that they got to working on. So I'd love to just start there. You know, um, obviously most recently you've been working a lot more on AI and and machine learning and sort of the cutting edge technology there. But how did you end up there? Uh, how far back do you want to go? I mean, we have recent history. Give you the, give you the whole shebang. What do you think? Whatever you think is most entertaining. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, because it's a it's a 25 year career now in, in tech. So I graduated in '97, uh, CS from Stanford, and at the time, computer graphics was my first love. And so, first job out of college was a small startup. We're doing special effects software uh, for for movies. So if you watch The Phantom Menace, you know you can see our software at work back in the late '90s there. Um, and then kind of caught the dot com bug in '99 when that was going, and ended up starting in a company that was venture funded. Actually, after the dot-com bust, so in December of two, 2000 was the, was the funding round from Sequoia Capital, which was a really interesting time to build a company because everyone else was going bankrupt. And this was a time when I remember the first couple of months of that company, I'd get a spreadsheet every week of assets from <laughs> companies that would be like, you know, Sun servers and desks and Arion chairs and, and all sorts of stuff. So it was, a, it was a formative time in terms of learning how to manage through, I think, what, some of what we're going through now, which is a hard, hard economic cycle. Um, ended up selling that company and joined Mozilla in 2005, right after Firefox 1.0 was launched. And they were kind of turning from a nonprofit to this deal with Google and trying to figure out what to do, how to invest in the community, and stayed there until 2008, till I joined Facebook, which was this little social network that was smaller than MySpace when I joined it um, in 2008, uh, and uh, you know, spent the last 14 years there. And what was the um, obviously throughout? Facebook and now Meta's history, like the, the set of technologies that were relevant evolved very quickly over time. At one point, mobile was sort of, you know, the most important thing. Um, then later, sort of uh, AI became the most important thing. And then maybe more recently, a lot of the, the metaverse hardware is like, is also incredibly relevant. How, how did, you know, what, um, maybe A, what did you expect going in? Like there were going to be the technologies that you have to care about and how, what was that process of sort of like snaking through and, and evolving? the sort of like perspective as to what are the most relevant technologies. Yeah, and that's part of why, you know, I've been there so long is it, it changed all the time. And so it wasn't just the same thing. As you said, when I, when I joined, it was web, 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 web. We had to build and scale the website. And a lot of the core challenges there were, how do you build this sort of rapid interconnected website at, at massive scale? People knew how to build sort of um, multiple reader, single writer websites. So in a, in a search engine at the time, it wasn't very personalized. So, you know, if you searched for scale on Google, you'd get the same results I did. Caching made that really easy to scale. Well, on a social network, when someone posted a post and a bunch of people are liking and commenting, you want to see all those updates in real time. So a lot of the early years were like building a brand new set of caching, software layers, databases, et cetera, that, that, would, that would allow us to scale this thing because there wasn't anything off the shelf. That was sort of like the first technical regimen. And out of that was born Open Compute, which was this system for building data centers because 
data centers were these like hot proprietary thing and how do you make them efficient and cool and all the rest of it, we decided to sort of open source that. And you're gonna hear this thread throughout the rest of our talk when we get to AI. Um, and so that was, that was kind of the phase one. Um, and then we kind of like just had gotten that figured out and then mobile hit. And you know, for people who haven't been through a platform transition, it's like, it's a language change. We're using PHP, um, HTML, JavaScript. You know, now it's Objective-C and Java because you're doing iOS and Android. You know, in 20, 2009, it's like, you can't hire people with five years of iOS experience. Like, right. they didn't exist. Right. Right? <laughs> so you were kind of making it up as you went along. The tool chain was terrible. Yep. Um, this is gonna sound very familiar to anyone in AI right now. And like, I actually think early days of mobile feel a lot like AI does right now in terms of like lots of promise and excitement, but man, did the tools stink. Um, and so you spent a lot of time sort of building best practices and tooling. We stubbed our toes a couple of times before we got to, on the web it was React, and on mobile it was eventually React Native as sort of a way to do it. Um, and then, yeah, in 2012, 2013, you know, this was the AlexaNet days where it was kind of like, oh my gosh, deep learning might actually work this time. Um, and we were lucky enough to sort of spot that and saw some of the applications in our products, brought Jan Lacun in to, to fund a AI research lab and you know, spent the last decade sort of building you know, technology and tools um, in AI. Yeah, there will be a there will be a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of really interesting things I want to dig into there. Maybe the first one is like, what were the early signals that indicated that like that Facebook needed to bet big in AI because it was one of the sort of very big bets at the time and and within the industry, um, you you know Facebook mu moved much faster than many of its peers except maybe Google um, yeah. in in betting big in AI. What was sort of the what were the things that you recall? being extremely convincing of the sort of like promise of the technology? Well, I'll tell you, all of these things always feel very obvious after the fact. <laughs> they always feel a lot less obvious while, while it's going on. Um, and, you know, there was these funny moments where, of, of course, we saw the sort of the, the massive results in AlexaNet, but if you actually, you, you know, tried to, in the ImageNet competition, if you actually tried to apply these to real world problems, it still wasn't ready for prime time. Right. I mean, we had a very rudimentary version of, of object recognition sort of yep. running. And I remember like shopping into people and it was like, we had like, I was like five categories. I think we could like, it's like people, dog, cat. So I was like, I can tell you with 60% precision that there's a person in this photo, you know, and people would be like, almost every photo has a person in it. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, go work on something else useful for me. And, and, but, but to me, what I always look for, and, and this is true in, in VR as well, is a little bit less kind of where you are today and what's the slope of the curve of advancement. And so I said, okay, yeah, this doesn't really work for commercial applications today, but like, wow, the pace of improvement here is really picking up. And then you sort of do the first derivative of like, what is fueling that pace of innovation? And are those things going to continue too? And it was like uh, data, compute, like more investment means more, more um, and new algorithms and, and network architectures. That stuff all felt like it had a lot of room to run. And so it was like, huh, this seems really interesting. We should just like get going because if we can apply it to a bunch of problems that are interesting at the company, there's gonna be a lot of value there. Right. Yeah, and I think that, you know, Facebook is one of, or is now Meta, is one of like the true sort of technology companies in the, in the sense that I think the um, the company evolved itself from a technology standpoint over and sort of reinvented itself from a technology standpoint over and over again with um, with seemingly quite a bit of ease. It, it, that kind of makes sense. I think it's easy for you know many other companies to get sort of you get sort of stuck in the original conception or the original sort of set of hypotheses or axioms yeah. that created the initial like spurt of success. Whereas you know any great company is is forced to reinvent itself consistently over time. What do you think, you know, I, I'm curious what you think about this sort of this like um, ability to techno basically constantly be technologically innovative and then find a way to apply that to the business problems that, that Facebook had. I'm curious if that was something you actively thought about. I'm curious how you instilled that within the, within the company, how you instilled that sort of like that culture within yeah. the leadership framework. Well, I'm glad you think it was easy. It didn't feel easy. <laughs> so, so I think it's, an, which is an important distinction because I think for anyone who's struggling, like it, it is always hard. It was never easy. And every one of these things, even when they were successful, were all hard. And I can talk about React. I can talk about PyTorch. Like these things were all like born out of a lot of stress and disagreement and failures prior to them. They didn't just like pop out and everyone's like, well, this is obvious and built it. Like that's just never how it works. Um, because what, I, what I'd say is it really takes, is it takes, 
two things. It takes leadership. Like there are times when you have to just push an organization to, to go in a different direction. When we made the shift to mobile, you know, it was a pretty severe shift. And, you know, Mark very famously said, you know, don't ever bring me any prototypes that are on web. Like I only want to see things on mobile and people didn't take them seriously. And so the first time someone showed up with like a, a mock for a new product, he's like, wait, these are web mocks. And they're like, yeah. And he's like, I said mobile only come back with mobile. I don't want to look at this now. And they're like, oh, you're serious. Like we have to do everything in this way. Um, and it causes, and like the tools weren't as good. People didn't know how to do it. Like this is harder. It's like, yep, it's harder, but it's where the future is. So we have to do it. So sometimes you have to use leadership to say like, I know this is strictly worse right now, but it's going to get better over time. And we like no, no better time than the sooner to do that. The second is, um, you know, I, I think never ever underestimate the power of inertia. Like people, organizations, things like why are smart people like not getting on to the next trend? Because there's a whole bunch of inertia pushing them in this direction, right? And that, so I spent a lot of my time in my career kind of like trying to read like where are things going naturally? And if they're going naturally in the direction that's good, you literally don't need me. Like I can go work on something else because you're good. If I walk away, inertia is taking you the right direction. Where are all the places where the inertia is taking really smart people in a direction that isn't the right place for the future? Okay, that's where I'm going to get in and like spend all of my time and energy, whatever I have to push, push, push really hard to twist you to get into the direction of the future. Um, and that may be AI, it may be mobile, it may be a different framework. Um, and that's, so that's kind of where I spent all of my time is trying to push us in those directions. So, um, and I said too, but I'll, I'll say the last is just, you know, these innovations always come bottom up. When you look at Torch, PyTorch, when you look at React, React Native, um, a lot of the work we did in the data centers, the work we did for caching in the early days, this wasn't, I didn't go up to a whiteboard and basically be like, okay, here's how we're gonna do this, folks. It was, you kind of created a condition where people who understood the problems the deepest, who are like living them day to day, sort of came up with the best solutions. And you give some space for them to, to grow and there's often multiple solutions to the same problem. Really hard to figure out which one's the right one. If you pick too early, you'll probably pick wrong. So you just need a little time for these things to germinate and grow, and then you'll kind of see, like, wow, this is the one that people really choose because they love it. Um, and so then what you can do is get behind that thing and really sort of provide force and energy. That's sort of what happened with, with PyTorch, and we can talk about that in a bit. Yeah, totally. We'll definitely want to talk about that. Um, you know, let, now let's go to the sort of like the, the beginning of Facebook AI. I think the, the initial um, landing uh, organization was FAIR, I think. Um, but, uh, but in, in, you know, I think one of the decisions that you all made, uh, was to focus the, the, like be very focused from the outset on research and, um, and basically on the, on a set of problems that, you know, at least in the near term would seem pretty irrelevant to the, to the actual business challenges that, um, that Facebook had. And obviously now it's, you know, it's clear what the, what the gains you would get within your core business from a lot of the advancements in AI research um, have been. But I'm curious about that original decision. Yeah. Like, how did you think about focusing on research from the outset, bringing in Jan LeCun? Um, and then how did you think about sort of, um, how did you think about the progression in, in that initial period where, again, things weren't as obvious? Yeah. I mean, I had spent the five years prior saying no over and over again. A lot of people wanted to set up a research lab. They're like, oh, we're a successful company. Every successful company has. We should have Facebook research or whatever it is. And I said, no, 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 because I just I couldn't give a straight line to like why would we invest in that versus other things where we can invest in the business. When it when sort of this the the deep learning revolution restarted, we sort of and we started looking at applications, you know, in image recognition and others for what we could do. And and at the time, newsfeed was kind of our main ranking system, very manual, using very rudimentary early stage sort of ML techniques. And you sort of looked at it and you said, huh, if we had better systems for managing this, there's probably a lot of things, it was a guess, a lot of things we could apply to the business and it would be really good. Um, and the field was evolving really rapidly. And so like literally we were in situations where like, we're reading a paper and like trying to implement it. And I was like, well, if we're reading a paper and trying to implement it, we are already six months behind state of the art, basically. So the, the basic thesis here was, you know, let's have that work happening in house. Um, such that we can get much earlier access to it um, and have the expertise there to help us figure out when and how to apply it to, to the business um, for things. And the first choice was, you know, as we started thinking about what this would look like, I interviewed lots of folks and lots of folks wanted to build, again, a generalized research lab. They want to make Facebook research, they want to do software theory research and lots of other things. And we made a very explicit decision that like, hey, AI is a big enough field. I mean, AI is already a ridiculously expansive term. Um, like, let's just focus it there. 
right? And say like, that's all we're gonna do. And let's find, you know, the people. So that sort of filtered out a lot of people who wanted to be just a general research leader. I got, it was a small field at the time. So I got to talk to most of the people and I just called them up and said, hey, you know, wanted curious about this. And I talked to Jan and um, he was the one I talked to that had this very practical, you know, it's like really cared about research and open research and advancing the field, but also really cared that like eventually that research found its way into something useful. Um, and it just felt like a really good mesh for sort of what we were going for. And so I was able to convince him to join and sort of start up what became FAIR. Yeah. And, and what were the sort of like, um, uh, what were the moments in the sort of history of FAIR? Obviously now, like AI has just been this sort of, the past few years in particular of AI have been absolutely incredible and blockbuster and AI is going in mainstream in a way that is, you know, kind of would have been tough to predict. Um, certainly when, when FAIR got started, what, what were sort of the, the key moments along that path that felt like, you know, infl like what were the inflection moments, yeah. inflection points? Well, the very beginning period was just sort of, you know, this is the 2013 era, this is the ancient history now, a decade ago, right? Um, was just, as I said, you started to see interesting research results in supervised computer vision. So a bunch of qualifiers there, su supervised training and computer vision, a specific domain. Um, and, you know, so the very early days were like, can we get that to work for useful, like commercial applications, right? Yep. And that was years of work to say like, cool paper, like, can I actually make it do something useful for me from, from a business perspective? And so that was, it felt like sort of, and, and computer vision was an obvious place to start because it was sort of where we were going. And so, you know, what, what I thought about is the researchers were sort of plowing the field ahead saying like, okay, I've got a new, better state of the art model, you know, using this training data set, et cetera. Maybe it's too slow in, from inference standpoint for production, but like we can uplift that into production. Um, and then you saw other applications, things like, you, you know, I remember uh, sort of being able to not just identify what's in an image, but, but mask out certain things in it, right? And say like, okay, I can identify the person in this image. This actually became the technology that powered the Facebook portal, which is a video chat device that has a software oriented camera that sort of frames you in the shot, like an you know, AI cameraman. And yep. now you see this in products throughout the world. You know, mask or CNN was the technology behind that in the beginning, which was like, how do you do this real time masking without a green screen or trackers and all the rest of it, which was again, state of the art in the, like the 014, 15, you know, time era. And so you had this sort of like steady march of improvements in supervised sort of um, machine learning, particularly computer vision, sort of starting to pick up product applications, you know, across the board and early implementations of that went into content moderation and, and others. Um, and then you sort of had expansion in a couple of directions that were really exciting to me. The first was we had a big push to multimodal. It's like, okay, computer vision's neat, but like, can you work across modalities? Um, and, you know, in languages, can we do multilingual, you know, so especially if you're trying to like classify text or identify something, if you can, you know, people on Facebook use hundreds of languages, not just one, can you build one model that can work across multiple? Cause we're building, you know, a single model in a single task area in a single language. And if you, you do the multiplication on that from a ops perspective, you now have thousands or tens of thousands of these things in production and updating and managing that as an asset. So it's like, can we replace all of these with a smaller number of big models. And I, you know, again, now that is the way things work. <laughs> but I remember you know, a period of time when, when it was like, hey, the, the, the monolingual models continue to outpace the multilingual. It's just behind. And it was like this horse race to try to get this team. We just kept investing and kept investing, saying, I hope we can get this to work. And then there was this one moment where like, it's really close on the core languages, and the multilingual model crushes the monolingual models on the languages with less data. And you're just like, oh wow, this is like a turning point. And then you, you started expanding multilingual, multitask, so it's not just you know, classifying text for this purpose, it's also for that, and then multimodal, we're using task images. So you just, this massive expansion sort of in these things that has dramatic applications for ranking recommendations, content moderation, enables products like Portal. Um, these advances in computer vision also made VR possible. So not exactly these technologies, but the, what we're seeing there gave us the confidence to say VR used to require all the specialized hardware, now, if you've used an Oculus Quest, you go and buy it from Best Buy, take it out of the box, put it on, and it works. And all of that is computer vision. You know, it's inside out tracking um, from cameras on the device. Um, and that, again, back in the day was like a lot of smart people saying this will never work, um, but, but here we are. Um, so that was kind of this, like, this march of supervised learning moving out of the domain of computer vision across all of these things. In the middle of all of this, when we were deep, like trying to just like get all this stuff to work, Jan starts running around going like, yeah, you know, this supervised learning thing, it's only gonna go so far. We really need to work on unsupervised learning or self-supervision as everyone calls it now. And I remember being really frustrated about this. 
<laughs> so like, yeah, we like literally are just getting this stuff to work and you're telling me to go work on something else. But he was right. Um, and we started investing early. We started seeing things like wave to vec which is an early, um, you know, unsupervised speech recognition system um, and um, have seen lots of language. And we can talk about like releases in the last three months that, that are on this train of, of self-supervision. But to me, that was the second tranche of this, which is like self-supervision. Um, and watching that sort of really start to take over the whole industry now and it's like the exciting thing and unlocks a lot of new possibilities. And then I'd say the third like track here was just the tool, tool chain. Like from the very beginning, the tool chain was terrible. People have always fight about tool chains and sort of we went through lots of Cafe 2 and Original Torch and then in 2016, PyTorch was born and then that's been a sort of slow evolution of that sort of becoming the thing of choice for us and, and now I think in a lot of the industry too. So along the way, as with the mobile, the data center revolution, we're kind of like trying to build the tools because they're so important. They're such a point of leverage that not just us, but hopefully the whole industry can use. Yeah, totally. Well, one of the things is you, thank you for outlining that. You know, one of the things that struck me as you were going through that is like the, the pace, well, two things. A, the pace is just very, very fast, astronomical, which is, you know, sometimes hard to remember when you're in it and, and trying to relive it or you're living it day to day. And then the second is that the, the sort of, um, the sort of expansionary path or the sort of like the, the scope of, uh, of what was, what the technology could tackle just grew very dramatically. And there were a lot of sort of like, um, very zero one moments, if that can make sense. Like, yeah. like the moment that you described around the translation or the, the multilingual models where it was like worse, 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 worse. And then all of a sudden, like yeah. something flips and it gets, it gets quite good. And, you know, we've seen that moment with, you know, certainly recently with the large language models yep. and the, the sort of um, the uh, diffusion models, the, the yep. image image generation models. Um, so a few questions that arise out of that. I think the first one is, um, the, and this is just your personal opinion. Do you expect, do you expect the pace in AI to continue or do you, and, and, and cause if so, it kind of is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it'd be a thing to behold, but yeah, yeah. For, first off, do you think, do you think the pace, keeps up um you know i think going back to one of the very first questions i was like i always try to look below the surface and say like what are the factors that are fueling advancements and do the other factors like in your favor or are against you and i think you know to date um it's been uh ability to harness increasing amounts of compute um you know with advancements in gpu in particular and interconnects um it's been uh able to you know ingest a lot more data you know, ImageNet in uh, 08 was what, tens of thousands of images, right? Which is just like laughably small then. At the time, if you go talk to Feifei, that was like transformational. I was like, what the heck are we gonna do with 50,000 images? I can't adjust that. You know, and, and today you're just like, you know. So, um, so I think that, you know, has room to grow, but I have some concerns there and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then there's a question of like algorithmic or network, um, you know, innovation. Throughout this whole period, you had sort of convolutional neural nets and then sort of derivatives and enhancements. So like ResNets was the thing for a while in terms of, of computer vision. And then obviously Transformers has been sort of the network architecture that's been powering a lot of the advancements in, in recent large language models. So you're sort of banking on the like undiscovered new trick, right, of some sort that, that gets there unless you believe we've got the final network architecture, which I don't think most people believe. So I, I think there's like I'll give you a complicated answer, which is like, I think there's rooms to be optimistic and there's reason to be pessimistic. You know, on the compute side, CPUs are kind of stalled, um, you know, chip, chip fab processes are slowing down, but there does look to be some more room to go in terms of like basic compute, H, H100 is, you know, 50, 50% faster than the A100 from NVIDIA on core tasks. Um, and then you can optimize for certain networks. So they build a bunch of specialized hardware for, for tensors, for, uh, sorry, transformers. Um, and so I think we've got, you know, another five years at least of like good progress in compute just by making these things wider and more powerful and, and doing interconnects and figuring out how to harness that. So that that's a kind of in our favor. I don't think it's the next 50 years. I think we get some of that. Data is a really interesting one because I think we're starting to see in these large language models that like at some point data quality, like you're gonna come back to data quality mattering and just ingesting more and more data that doesn't give you differentiated data points is probably not gonna enhance things past and I think this is a really interesting area of research, and I think a lot of people, we're now in the phase where people are like, can I get the same results of this big sort of like un, unfiltered data set by doing a data set 10x smaller, but like it's carefully curated. And so I think data manipulation management, 
The one area I have a lot of optimism there is data synthesis. So I think we haven't done a lot for like 3D synthesis of data and others. So anytime you can generate the data, then you basically have an unlimited data set and you get to choose where the distribution is. So I think a lot of the innovation in the next couple of years is gonna come out of how we manage data, how we curate it, how we find it, how we generate it um, in interesting ways. And I think if we can do that, that'll produce a lot of interesting things. And then you just have this X factor of just sort of like, what's the pace at which a clever new idea shows up um, you know, in terms of network architecture. And what, if you look back at the history, I think these three things tend to correlate together. Cause like, you like, oh, this thing's saturated. It's, you know, the training rate looks like this. Let me start experimenting with the network, right? And then the network's like, oh, we just like the training, the training looks like there's no reason to mess with the network. Like figure out how to feed it more data and you're screwing with it. And you kind of, you're solving each one of these incrementally. So as long as they're all like, as long as data and computer are still moving, you have some room to then kind of force innovation, I think, in that. Plus, just given the, the investment in the community, so I'd say I'm I'm optimistic, but I you know I'd say over the next five years, over the next ten or so, I'm not I don't know. Right. Yeah. And there's a number of I mean like um, the, to your point, all these things are paired together, right? The the networks uh, end up being developed to sort of like utilize the the compute capacity of the chips as well as possible, and then obviously vice versa, where the chips then get designed to yeah. handle the networks better. Data is this sort of like interesting fuzzy one where because so much of the outside of data scale, everything else is so hard to measure yeah. that it means that you know it's so hard to drive consistent improvement. But but you're right that like people in the industry obviously and most people have the intuition for sure that you know sweating the details on the data is likely to yield you know dramatic gains. And then yeah. you know one of the the interesting components here too is that like if you look at the large language models they've saturated on most of the data, or not most of the data, but a lot of the data on the public internet. You know, there's probably not that much yeah. high quality text data left to like pull off of the open internet. And so we do need to be a lot smarter about this data that we do have and like how do we utilize that to, yeah. to greater gain. Um, I, I wanted to now talk about PyTorch just because it's, it's uh, you know, obviously become the the dominant platform yeah. um, for AI development and uh, and it's happened pretty quickly over the course of the past you know five six years. Um, t t tell us about the story of it. Like how did it how did it come about originally? And then um, you know uh, Facebook and and you did an interesting thing in supporting it um, as a platform despite it being pretty independent of the sort of uh, business that Facebook had. Sort of it, it was not clear what the exact business tie-in is. And so I'm curious about that decision as well and, and um, how that whole thing played yeah. out. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in like investing in tools and infrastructure because they're just such a lever point to like, like I'm here writ large in life to increase the pace of progress for like humans and prosperity. And so I like, think AI is really interesting and, and one of the reasons I, I work on this, but you know, in, in, in for PyTorch in, in particular, you know, if you go back to 2014, 15, that, that era, it was sort of the wild west of tools out there. You know, there was this thing called Cafe 2, which is pretty big in the computer vision community. You know, Google had come out with TensorFlow, which was an amazing, um, really well-engineered tool, optimized at the time, at least, more for you know, production deployment. So it sort of traded sort of research flexibility for engineering performance um, and others. And it was you know, amazing for that set of tasks. So, you know, and, and the way we set up our research lab was, you know, you give people a lot of freedom. And so you don't come in and say like, you must use this tool and this framework and use this. And so, um, so there was a lot of experimentation um, and a lot of sort of self-selection. And so it was fun to see what people were using. Um, and some of the researchers we had brought on uh, had worked on Torch, which was the precursor to PyTorch, um, similar API, but um, Lua is the main scripting uh, language. Um, and they liked the, the sort of, um, the direct programming style of it. You know, when you're doing research, it's like, I can just hand write code and get it done. I'm not like trying to fit into some framework. And for the purposes of research, that was that was really powerful. And they, the API was, was sort of unobtrusive and cleanly designed, very small. Um, and so there was a lot of interest in that, a lot of time and energy trying to push, you know, um, Torch as, as the thing. Our production teams had sort of out of desperation sort of used Cafe 2 because we're doing a lot of computer vision stuff and that was sort of what worked. So we had this sort of split world. So I'll be honest, in the beginning, I had a point of view that like, you know what? Needs of production, performance, monitoring ability, efficiency, et cetera, are actually quite different than research, which is all about speed and flexibility, right? And if you just think about designing a system to like accomplish both, 
um, you know, it's really hard. It's kind of like, have you ever seen a car repair shop? It's like, we specialize in foreign and domestic. And it's like, that's not what specialized means. Like, <laughs> it means you specialize in all cars, right? And so, um, so I kind of had this long debate with Jan about like, you know what? Maybe Torch is our like, you know, 3D printer and Cafe 2 is our concrete. It's sort of like you prototype here and then you have to rewrite it. It's not that much. Like at the time, it's like what, 5,000 lines of code? That's not a big deal to rewrite, just rewrite it. And so that was sort of one model we were doing and we were struggling with it because it just like, it added this level of like mental friction that it didn't totally account for which is, you know, a researcher showed up and like, I have this cool new thing. And everyone's like, oh, that's in Lua. Like, I don't even know how to port that. <laughs> like, I'll just do my thing, you know? And so it just created this like ongoing friction. So it sort of upped our desire to try to have a system that we could use across research and production. Um, people loved Torch, the API. Getting people to use Lua, it was just, it's a, it's a beautiful language, but it's just not that popular. And there's a ton of libraries in Python. And so it's obviously, it was like, can we just do this in Python? And so we just started pushing it in Python. Again, in the Torch community, this was controversial because the people who really loved Torch loved the simplicity of Lua. And PyTorch, Python added a bunch of complexity. And so this wasn't, again, an easy gimme. But as soon as we started pushing in this direction, you saw a lot of pull demand from researchers. Right. Researchers were like, oh man, I can use all my Python libraries and this and that. Like, whew, this is great. And you just, like, you just saw it just like take off like crazy throughout the, our internal research community and others. And from the very beginning, we wanted this to be open. So I'm like, look, a tool like this, which is a basic fairly low level framework for AI research, like the more people that are investing in this, the better. It's kind of like why I think Linux is great. It's like, we don't all need to build our own special operating systems. We can sort of collaborate above that layer or, or compete above that layer and collaborate below. Um, and that's what we thought for, for PyTorch. And so, and then there's a long sort of history from there, but it you know, has, has taken off. And then I think the biggest thing is, you know, uh, we're recording this on Tuesday. Yesterday we announced that it's the PyTorch Foundation is now a sub-foundation in Linux. So this is like a institution that's now in the community for, you know, the community to support. There's like 2,400 contributors and 18,000 orgs that are using PyTorch. This is like a thing that I hope outlasts me um, in terms of its contributions to the, to the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. You know, one, one piece that, you know, in, the, in sort of that middle history that you left out that I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on is, um, obviously, PyTorch wasn't the only <laughs> deep learning framework out there. Google had, had TensorFlow. And PyTorch was clearly sort of, um, or I, shouldn't, I don't know if clearly, but uh, was very beloved and, and grew faster over the course of that, you know, intervening maybe four or five year period. Um, what do you attribute that to? Like, why do you think um, PyTorch would manage to grow more quickly and get more adoption and, and how do you sort of maintain that or think about preserving that? Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, it's, it's really hard to know because you, you can't do the B-test on these things. And I think people often rewrite these histories. You know, but, but what I did observe is, is a couple of things that we try to maintain today in, in, in our support of PyTorch. One is, is like from the very beginning, like this is not a meta Facebook thing. This is like something we're trying to build with and for the community. So it wasn't like choose the Google thing or the Amazon thing or the Microsoft thing or the meta thing. It was like, actually there should be a community oriented version of this and trying to really orient in that way. And if you look early days, like people like Sumith and others, like they were spending their weekends answering questions on forums. Like they were just, they were just there to help the community in a really positive way. Um, and there was a really guarded approach to the API surface. Um, you know, this was a framework designed by researchers for researchers. And so there was a lot, you know, this is the, you know, the death of every piece of software. It's just like, let's just add a couple, couple new API calls, couple new features, and you do that over five years. And like your once beautiful thing is now this like hulking monstrosity that like a new person looks at. It's like, I don't even know where to, where to get started on this, right? And so simplicity, simplicity, simplicity was like burned in from the very beginning um, to try to like keep the API surface as small and as simple as possible all the way through. And the other thing is just knowing our customer set. In the very beginning of PyTorch, we said, look, the underserved community here is the research community. That and like, per my prior comment, like research and production have different needs. So trying to be like the best for both out of the gate is really hard. When in doubt, go for the research community. Go say like, we're gonna support the researchers. And so if this feature for performance or whatever makes it harder for people to iterate and experiment, we're not gonna do it. And then you kind of see that carry forward. And I'll talk about a really hard transition point from here where like very careful guarded evolution of the API doing really smart things like providing a very simple C++ API in addition to the sort of the Python API, Python compatibility across the board, and that sort of customer service lens, which is we're here. So 
I think this is why there are you know thousands of contributors, most of whom don't work at Meta, you know, as part of the project. Having been at Mozilla back in the day, um, you know, 2005, I've seen open source from the past. Like, you know, these things thrive when when people get out and what they put in, which is you know this thing is going to benefit the whole community, not just you know some corporation. And so I think just investing in that, and and I think um, there's two hard parts of this, and this is for any company that supported an open source project. You, you know, if you take the hard line, like explain to me exactly, like the ROI, like what's the revenue impact of these 50 engineers working on this open source project, I'm not going to be able to tell you. Like I can't write it down and say here's exactly where, where this is the profits. What I can say is like by having this awesome tool that's state of the art, that is the thing we use, it means we are state of the art in AI and will continue to be so. And that's like a huge lever for the company. I can't like boil it down to ROI. Um, and that's so much better than using an out of date tool chain, a proprietary tool that no one else uses, or something that's controlled by someone else that doesn't have the features that we need for what we want to do and we can't control that. Like those, like not being able to control your destiny is really important. And then I think the really hard pivot has actually happened in the last few years where, um, you know, back to this like research and production, it's like, hey, how do we get PyTorch into production more? Well, all the features that made it great for research like weren't tuned necessarily for performance and production, right? You're, you're, writing, you're writing this sort of imperative code, um, it's hard to optimize. And so we've been slowly figuring out how do you sort of add performance and optimization in there without breaking you know, what PyTorch is, and that's actually had a lot of success. And we're seeing a lot of pull from product teams who are like, I want the latest and greatest research. If we're using PyTorch in production, it makes it really easy to do that versus having to port it and redo it. And so that, this has, I think, been the, the most perilous part because we're sort of expanding the scope of the project. And I think, again, just trying to keep it as simple as possible as, as we're doing it. Yeah. I, I mean, I was going to ask you about that because obviously now, if PyTorch is the, is the sort of established, um, certainly the established research uh, uh, framework, but then so many people want to take, including you know, most ML engineers, want to take a lot of this research to production, especially now that the capabilities have gotten so great. And so... Um, the, the, the dichotomy that you framed at the outset is, sounds like the really tough problem. I mean, do you see, do you foresee any, um, I mean, it sounds like you all went through this process at Meta of trying to, like, trying to productionize PyTorch. Like, do you foresee any potential insurmountable gaps in that process, or do you think that, you know, you're gonna be able to productionize just fine? I don't think it's insurm, like, I don't think there's any, like, structural or, like, violate the laws of physics gaps, but I think there's a lot of hard work and trade-offs, because this all boils down to, like, where do you put the abstraction? So, you know, PyTorch, I think it was 112 that released this summer, you know, added a new um, transformer, better transformers, you know, optim optimization. And if you use that optimization, like, your transformers are going to be significantly faster, actually significantly faster than most of the other frameworks out there for production inference. Um, and you don't have to use them, and if you don't use the particular you know framing that gets the optimization path, then you don't get the optimization wins. And I think that that sort of that general approach to things of sort of like picking the right layers of abstraction, making things optional, giving you if you're programming a new network architecture, go nuts, fine, you know. But starting to figure out like when there are places that you know we used to optimize at the like all the way down at the CUDA layer, like that's a little too low level for us these days. Like we should be optimizing at the network architecture layer and like fusing ops up there. And so that's what we're sort of trying to do with with better transformers. And like I think you know, in the history of computing, you, you will see the sort of the the bar slowly go up, but you don't want to get ahead of it. People get so excited over and over again about compilers and like how much magic can come out of a compiler. And compilers are amazing pieces of engineering, but there's been so many failures where people over extend what a compiler can do and say, "We'll just program in all this really high level stuff, and I'll just make it magic underneath." And like. Mm, until you really understand the frame of things, it's, it's useful to program a layer down. And that's where we're, we are now with like programming at the network architecture layer rather than the like CUDA layer. But like eventually it'll, it'll sort of move up and you'll have some of these optimizations. So, um, so, you know, I just think there's a lot of hard work and just holding the line on, you know, simplicity and not trying to sort of over engineer it and listening to the community and what, what they need. The hardest thing in building any toolkit is saying no. Like, right. It's just like everyone wants to add a feature. There's a good reason for it, and like it's not fun to say no to people. But like I think that's what that sort of is what it takes to build a good thing that people love over time. Yep. Um, cool. I want to switch gears now to some of the applications of the great AI technology. So there's two I want to drill into in particular. One is sort of um, AR and VR. Yeah. Um, which is something I'm sure you've spent a fair amount of time thinking about. Um, and the second uh, is is climate change because I know that's another one yeah. that you've spent a bunch of time thinking about. So first on, on AR, VR, I mean, 
Um, I think uh, a lot of us have seen the sort of demos and, and, and are excited about the sort of like conception of the, of the future. But what are sort of some of the big AI problems that you think are left in the path of, of getting to just like, you know, the, the sort of sci-fi, yeah. um, extremely exciting conceptualization of AR and VR? Uh, we don't have enough time to cover them all, but, and this is really exciting. And this is, I think the path that, that, so first of all, it's just like, it wouldn't be possible without AI. I said this sort of offhand, but like VR doesn't work without AI. AR doesn't really do anything interesting without AI. Like literally the products are basically useless without it. So even just what we have today is possible. I can talk you through things that are like fairly close, that are fairly near term, that would be amazing. I think for AR, one of the things I would be really excited about is captioning, closed captioning for the real world, yep. along with real-time machine translation. So imagine being able to travel and just getting like literally a closed caption of what everyone is saying to you, you know, translated in your native language. Like that's not next year, but that is, you know, next five to 10 years. I think we have all the basic building blocks of, of making that happen. And it doesn't require crazy, you know, hardware on, on the AR system. When you start looking at other applications of AR, it really is about sort of sensing and predicting and doing things. So being able to observe the world around me um, and, you know, answer some simple questions. There's things people struggle with every day. Like, did I lock the front door? Did I take my medicine this morning? Like, where did I put my keys? You know, and if you imagine a sensing device with me that's sort of with me all morning and it just pops up a little photo and says like, oh, here's your, you know, here's your, you know, keys on the, on the countertop and boom, here's a picture of you sort of opening the pillbox. You did take your medicine this morning, right? So a, a sensing suite around you that can then figure out the right instances of time. This pushes into sort of contextual recognition in real-time video streams, which is way beyond the state of the art right now. So if I'm running through and looking at video, being able to pick out the salient moments is hard enough offline with lots of compute. You know, having a device here, like capturing all, only the key moments um, is going to be really hard. And, and I think one of the things that people don't appreciate about the difficulty of AR is there are just hard thermal limits. Like anytime you do compute, you have heat, you need to get rid of that heat. You're wearing a device on your head. And there's like a, a hard limit to how much heat I can exhaust from a device on my face. Um, and that limit isn't gonna change. And so we have this fixed compute envelope that we need to sort of get things into. So I think a lot of clever co-evolution of sensors and AI and others to like make these things work really well that are very low power for, for similar, you know, multiple orders of magnitude production. So there's a, this is, and this is all work happening in, in the RL labs, um, FRL labs and with, a, with the FAIR team. And there's a lot of exciting stuff going to happen, you know, over the next 10 years here. Yeah. Do, do you think that there's a, uh, I mean, in some sense, you, you could argue there might be a fundamental limit where because of the, the hard constraint on the amount of computer, amount of flops, basically, that, that you could do with respect to, frankly, the amount of complexity or even just the amount of, um, like, from an information theoretical perspective, the amount of complexity that you'd have to handle. Like, do you think that there... Is, is some sort of fundamental limit if you like if sandwich between those two constraints or? I, th there is, but I don't know where it is yet because I, I think that um, there are lots of ways around it or reducing it. Um, and so, um, so I think this is where a lot of the, you know, it, it, you know if I'm running a, a normal optical camera that's capturing 60 frames a second and trying to process every frame and do useful things, like the power, your power budget is way over what you can actually do. Um, but you can start saying like, how could I, you know, use lower res sensors at lower power to capture similar things and fire up the high power sensors where needed? Like, then you can start doing things at, at mult, you know, order of magnitude less power. I also think that, you know, that the classic of silicon is like kind of like general purpose. I run an algorithm. I get like slightly specialized hardware, like you know, um, uh, MMX or equivalents, um, you know, and then I get like the algorithm burned into silicon. And each one of those gives you generally an order of magnitude sort of improvement in power performance. So, um, so I think we haven't gotten anywhere close to the third, which is like, I know exactly what algorithm I'm running. I've like written it in silicon in a, in a specific chip to do that. Um, that can give me a whole lot of headroom from a power perspective. So, you know, I think the biggest problems in AR right now are in actually constructing the displays. I mean, there was a huge challenge in getting photons into my eye to compete with these really bright lights so I can still see and read and then have the, the system that delivers that small enough to be cosmetically so I don't, you know, look like I've got a helmet on um, and light enough and enough power. Like I, that, the hardware to me is, is the limiting factor here. Once we can start getting hardware out in the real world, then you can start building the use cases and data. And that's really a lot of what's, what's slowing us down uh, on this. Yeah.
And then on, um, on climate change, because I know this is an area that you spend a bunch of time thinking about and, and working on, um, what are you most excited about just in terms of how we can apply modern technologies to sort of tackle climate change? Using AI or just more broadly? Uh, let's, let's focus on AI. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, the, if you think about climate change, there's one part of it that is just like optimizing the heck out of lots of different systems, right? Like, do you think the heating and cooling system in every commercial building is optimized like properly? The answer is like, absolutely not, right? We do this a lot in the data center because it, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of electricity and it's worth it for us. And there's just a lot of room to go in buildings, you know, across the world. And that's like, you know, buildings are 10, 10, 20% of emissions. So, and you just sort of like walk through all the things and say like, if I can optimize the system better, like, are there things I can do? There's other places where sensing is really important. So if you wanna be figuring out how much carbon am I sequestering you know, on a farm? I've added an additive, I'm doing some differential farming practice, and in theory, that farming practice captures more carbon in the soil. Well, if I have to like, you know, drill a core hole sample three feet deep and take it to a lab and analyze it to determine the carbon you know, footprint of that, you're just never gonna scale that. If I instead can use LIDAR or satellite or aircraft imagery and build and train a machine learning model which can look at the soil and, and determine that, then boom, you've got a scalable solution. A similar question in the oceans where there's a lot of exciting work happening there and how do you measure you know, using floating sensors and sort of assume you know, what the alkalinity is and what the captured carbon and organic carbon is in that, that part of the, the ocean. So there's a lot of places where sort of smart sensing is gonna be a really big deal. And I think automation you know, uh, is, is gonna help a lot, robotics and others uh, you know, in these fields. And then there's so many places in industry where we haven't actually applied the last 20 years of understanding. If we broaden a bit from AI, like AI is one tool, but there's material science. Like we've, we've made a lot of progress in basic material science. There's like process optimization. There's all sorts of exciting things when you just like realize you now have an economic incentive to optimize the system a little bit um, because of you know, shareholder pressure or because of regulation or because just people care now. Um, there's just like dramatic opportunity to do these things. And then there's lots of places where, you know, um, big leaps can happen, um, which, is, which is really exciting. I mean, I think we're seeing, you know, if you look at the, the advances happening in fusion, you know, fusion's been the joke of like every 10 years, fusion's gonna show up. If you actually talk to the people who are working on it, most of those advances are because we can do a lot better computational modeling and prediction of what's happening. You're basically trying to manage this like superheated plasma, you know, keep it of the right shape and the right size so it doesn't hit the containment vessel. And like so much of that is like, okay, how do I, or like it's not some massive breakthrough in some laser. It's like, okay, we just like tune the way the lasers are done to get it to be a perfect sphere and then ignition happens. Um, and so computational, particularly AI is massive for that. Being able to predict and simulate how I should design that thing is massive. Talking about designing cars and ships and other things like that using computational models is is huge. So I am more excited about the next like 10 or 20 years because I, I feel like we spent a bunch of this talk talking about the like the really sharp edge of the state of the art of AI. And like even if all like, you know, uh, neural IPS just like shut down and there's no more papers and we just like no new advancements, we've got a long time to just take what we already know and deploy them throughout the world and make a whole lot of stuff like way better for, for everyday people. And so that, that, and then we're also gonna make a bunch of advancements. So like you put those two together and it's, it sounds like a pretty exciting decade. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think you're exactly right. And I wanted to like wrap with, uh, you, you made a comment earlier in the talk about uh, basically what you thought, you know, effectively was like your personal mission or, or whatnot. Yeah. You know, why, why, why are you on this earth? And I'd, I'd love to just wrap with that. You know, you sort of said half a sentence about it, but I'm, I'm curious if you had articulated, what do you think, what is your sort of personal mission? Well, I think advancements in technology have the best opportunity to you know, take people out of poverty and advance the human condition writ large across the world. That's my reading of the last 200 years of history. And so I'm here to try to accelerate those advancements in ways that can help humanity. And this is why you know, when I'm not spending time on AI, I'm spending all my time on, on climate tech and trying to scale companies that capture carbon from the atmosphere, decarbonize industries across the board. And I think these things are win-win. I think we can have better products that are more enjoyable and are a lot better for the planet. If you've driven an electric car, it's like better than a gas car. Not because it's electric, because it's like faster, quieter, doesn't need as much maintenance. It's like once you get over the cost curve on that and they get ch cheaper to buy, it's game over for gas cars. And I think that's the very beginning of what's gonna happen in a lot of products across the world. And so, um, you know, I'm here to just like get behind and push wherever I can. I love it. Well, thanks so much. This has been such a fun conversation. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Yeah. So, thank you. Thanks for having me.